uh, I would like to introduce our special guest and uh, thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. Uh, Embajadora Veronica Chachin from Chile is here with us. Uh, Embajadora uh, Anunciada Fernandez de Cordoba from uh, the Spanish Embassy, the Spanish Ambassador uh, in, in Europe, and Rafael Zulaika uh, from uh, the Fundación Elcano uh, from uh, Spain are joining us. He will have the presentation. And uh, first, I would like to ask uh, Veronica Jaquin uh, to have her, uh, her short briefing uh according to this nice event so the stage the virtual stage is yours veronica uh, your excellency the ambassador of uh, the kingdom of spain mrs anunciada uh, fernandez de cordova mr shol hailing executive director of fergum uh, mr rafael sulaika Director de la Real Instituto Sebastián Elcano. Dear speakers and guests, Kedesh Baratay. It is my pleasure to be present in this online event where we pay tribute to the legacy of the most important discoverers and travelers of history. The man that initiated the first voyage around the world the one that the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, and most importantly to me, the European that first set eyes on what it is now known as Chile. A land which, by the way, bears now his name since one of the 16 administrative areas in which Chile is divided is called the region of Magellan and the Chilean Antarctic in order to honor such an extraordinary man. Although history has recorded the Spaniard Diego de Almagro as the European in 1836, traveling south through the Inca Empire, 16 years earlier, Magellan and his crew had already set their gazes upon the beautiful land of Tierra del Fuego, land of fire. A cold, snowy, rainy, but fascinating land that takes its name from the hundreds of fires seen by Magellan's men while sailing through what they named the Strait of All Saint, now known as the Strait of Magellan. And still, one of the most dangerous waters to navigate. To think they did it in those fragile and cramped wooden ships on the 15th century only makes us admire the will, endurance, and bravery of those intrepid seafarers. But who were the people that set up those fires that burn both day and night? There were the tribes of the Selknam, Kaweshar, and Yaganes, among other tribes. The most captivating people the Europeans had ever seen. For instance, they were almost naked in a land where temperatures can reach way below zero degrees Celsius. To the then average height in Europe of just 1.60 meters. Do you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you again. Should I repeat, where did you <laughs> stay? <laughs> well, uh, I was talking about the average in, in, the, in the region, compared the height with the European on that time, it was 160 meter average and they were 180 meter average. They were also incredibly robust and had huge feet. 
So the Europeans call them the big footed or Patagones in Spanish. Henceforth, their land was called and is still called Patagonia, which I'm sure is a name very familiar to all of you. And as according to Shul just told us, you were talking about it yesterday. Unfortunately, those noble races that one inhabited the southernmost age of South America are not longer with us. Although some of their descendants may still inhabit southern Chile, we only have few traces left of their mysterious and beautiful culture, languages, and traditions. Such was the price paid for the colonization that started in our part of the world in the 19th century. Therefore, today, when we commemorate the encounter of two worlds, that of Europe and that of Americas, I would like to pay tribute to the native people of my continent, to the magnificent and wise life of the ancient indigenous American cultures, which only knew to respect and live in harmony with nature. I also hope all of you will be able to experience that part of my country one day, utterly beautiful and rich in traditions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your thoughts. And I would like to ask uh, Anunciada um, Fernandez de Cordova, the ambassador of uh, Spain to have uh, her briefing to the audience. The stage is yours. Uh, we, uh, I'm sorry, we cannot hear you. Could you switch on your microphone, please? Here. Yes, thank you. Kusunum Sepin, Drold, Yoregel Kivanok. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to join this, um, this meeting around uh, Magallanes and, and El Cano. We are celebrating today 500 years of the first circumnavigation of the Earth. In other words, that was the first complete sailing around the globe, which actually ended in the lovely coastal village of San Lucas de Barrameda in September 1522. The expedition, which was successively commanded by Fernando de Magallanes and Juan Sebastián Elcano, was the first to travel and discover the roundness of the world, as Elcano himself described it. The voyage started in 1519 and concluded in 1522, as I mentioned. Needless to say, the means of navigation in those days were still incredibly basic, and life aboard those primitive vessels lacked any comfort or safety. The, the whole trip was a leap of faith, a journey into the unknown, and an adventure full of potential dangers and without any chance of receiving any support or help. This extraordinary achievement in the history of humankind became possible thanks to a handful of very special men. Those were indeed men of exceptional daring, gifted with an extraordinary knowledge of the sea, a remarkable thirst for adventure and a never failing sense of duty and honor. It was precisely that deeply rooted sense of honor and sacrifice that allowed them to endure an extreme and terrifying way of life for three years that the expedition lasted. On the return uh, journey, they were surely guided by the wish of sharing their story, the dream of making history. The origin of this voyage arises from the rivalry between two kingdoms, Portugal and Castilla, which became, during the second half of the 15th century, the most powerful countries in the Christian West. The kingdom of Castilla sought new gold and spice routes at the end of the 15th century, avoiding the Portuguese maritime phase which after the Treaty of Alcazobas in 1479, reserved African waters to Portugal. <clears throat> and the fortunate miscalculation that brought Columbus in 1493 to the West Indies came 
full circle in 1522, when Juan Sebastián Elcano and 18 survivors from an initial 239 men returned from the expedition initiated by Magallanes with one single trip, the Victoria. That vessel carried a full shipment of spices that paid for the entire expedition and still left a substantial profit. The enormous uh, achievement of the expedition was not its original purpose, but it, it happened. Uh, the cir circumnavigation of the world, a voyage of over 45,000 nautical miles, which lasted more than 1,000 days. Magallanes was a great propagandist and sailor who had known by sight of the eyes the islands of spices. He assembled maps and balloons and accompanied by two aboriginals of Moluca, the Portuguese adventurer convinced the young king of Spain, Charles I, of the benefits of finding the path that Columbus had failed to find on his fourth voyage. Um, when Magallanes died in combat in the Philippines in April 1521, Elcano commanded the return voyage after deciding to sail west through the Indian Ocean and turn around Africa. And so happened uh, the first circumnavigation of the globe, proving that the Earth was round and that one could, by sailing in one direction, return to the initial point. The world would never be the same. Repercussions were immediate in different areas, commerce, communications, botany, cartography. The very realization that the, the earth was spherical and not just round. This event marked the entrance into an interconnected world like the one we are living in today. It marked the first step of globalization in history. Many centuries later, Constantinos Kavafis, an extraordinary Greek poet who loved the sea, but barely saved it, wrote his poem, Ithaca. And well, before that poem was written, Magallanes, Elcano and his men had clearly understood that the journey was indeed the destination. Köszönöm szépen. Thank you very much. I would like to ask our distinguished guest to stay with us. You can switch off uh, your microphone, but please stay with us. And if you will have some question from the audience uh, at the end of Rafa's presentation, uh, you will be asked to answer it. And now I call uh, Rafa Sulaika uh, from the Elcano Foundation to have the uh, presentation about uh, the big expedition of uh, Magallanes and, uh, and his team. Rafa, the stage is yours, so Okay, please. and let's hope microphone and image is okay, video is yeah. okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers, of course, of the Felgum Society and the Cervantes Institute for the invitation to participate in this very special seventh edition of the Day of Explorers. I hope, really hope, I have the opportunity to visit Budapest in the future and greet you personally. Uh, I will try to show you some slides. It's okay for the images? Yes, perfect. Okay, so, um, sorry. That's it. So here you are in Budapest. And here I am and the Elcano Foundation is in the you in the middle of the of Sorry, Europe. Rafa, could you could you start the presentation? Yeah. So uh, here here you are in the middle of Europe. No, 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 oh, no. Sorry. Uh, sorry, the presentation, uh, the, to play the presentation, because we are see the thumbnails of uh, the pics. You don't see the pictures? Just uh, the thumbnails. Uh, the ah, okay. Uh, 
so, se, ven, sí. se ven todas las fotos. No ah, se perdón, ven la que perdón, perdón. Diciendo. Ah, pues no sé por qué. A ver, a ver, a ver. Vamos a ver. So, could be presentation. No, it's okay. No, no. No. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> so, excuse me. Uh, so, okay now? No. 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 Rafa, me parece yeah. que debes. Sí. Me parece que debes compartir. Eh, ah, uh, no, compartir estoy compartiendo la imagen la... en sí. Ajá, porque ahora estamos sí. viendo la ventana con todas las fotos. Ya, y no estamos viendo la pantalla que yo he abierto. Una pantalla. Debes quitar esa... O sea, ahora estás compa la, con ese, esa compartición debes eliminarla. Sí. Vuelves a hacer clic en el mismo icono. De acuerdo. Y entonces, donde ves la foto, eso es lo que tienes. Eso, ahora está bien. ¿Ahora estamos bien? Bien, bien, bien. So sorry. <laughs> sorry for this technical... <laughs> Here. It's Thank okay? You. Yeah. Okay. So, I was, uh, first of all, I thank the organizers, of course, and uh, I was telling you that here you are, in the middle of Europe, and here I am, in the Basque Country, uh, with, between the Pyrenees and the Bay of Biscay, eh? very close from France and in the north of Spain. Uh, and this is, I will show you, the village of Getaria, so it's a harbor, and we are in the doors of the Atlantic Ocean. I have an important message for the audience. Uh, as uh, ambassadors and our two guests of honor, Spanish and Chilean ambassadors have already said, no one doubts that Magellan deserves, uh, as it has been underlined, um, all recognition as the determined organizer of the expedition and brave discoverer of the strait that has been named after him for five centuries. But let's be, let us be aware that he didn't not sail alone on the ship. You can see here Magellan. And uh, these prints show us that we can mark or art ma can make man a hero and a mythical character. Historian specialists know that very, very well that once the historical person is erased, he creates his own myth that contains in many cases truths which cannot be verified as historical. As a result, it is the mythical hero and not the historical character which remains imprinted in the collective consciousness. So, let us agree that Ferdinand Magellan should not receive the glory for the world first feat. He was killed, as said, during a battle of Mactan Island in the Philippines, in the Western Pacific, one year and a half before a small group of sailors really completed the first circumnavigation around planet Earth. Secondly, his discovery and commercial expedition was not intended to go around the world, but to go and return to the Maluku Islands, also known as Spice Islands, along the same path by an unknown route west and back. It seems to me that you can compare the myth of Magallan to the tip of an iceberg. It stands out on the horizon. You see here Magallanes' expedition and El Cano, even and the first round the world tour. But we don't really know what we have down here. And we all know what happened to the Titanic, don't we? So beyond the famous names of heroes, let's keep in mind the importance of context. Therefore, the objective of this lecture is to talk about the first round the world trip from an expanded point of view.
For instance, we will remember and talk about the nearly two, the, uh, sorry, 240 explorers from nine different countries embarked on five wooden ships without no GPS or engines on board. We will talk about the exceptional value of spices at that time. And we will, of course, introduce you to my compatriot, Juan Sebastián Elcano, here on your right. This is Magellan, and this is Elcano, an ideal, I mean Elcano, the bus navigator who really achieved that first round the world sailing expedition 500 years from now, returning to his homeland after three long years at sea on the Victoria, a ship built in the Basque country. That is why the story I want to tell you below is titled A Tale of Two Kind Captains, Magellan and the Basque Elcano. So let's go on. The fifth century of the first circumnavigation runs from August. 2019 to September 2022. 500 years ago, the Magallan expedition sailed in search of spices to Indonesia's Maluku and Islands, located an, at an uncertain point in the Indian Ocean. Those singular historical events had extraordinary consequences and on a planetary scale. From now on, nothing would be like before. I will therefore try to offer you a trip to the time of Magellan and Juan Sebastián Elcano to share with you how relevant the sea has been for us and to understand the context in which the first circumnavigation to Earth was carried out. You already know we are where I am speaking to you from. In the Basque country, we consider Juan Sebastián Elcano our first international Basque, let's say, ambassador. His personal history and the events he starts show the relevance of the sea for the Basques and how important the contribution of the Basque country has been to the history of great navigations and explorations. This story took place in the 16th century. So it occurred to me that it may be interesting to ask 16 questions to enrich our knowledge of what happened then and the changes produced by these exceptional events. And we will do it from an adventurer and explorer point of view. Since in their three years of traveling around the world, the crew had the opportunity to discover amazing things never seen before. And when, when sorry, what they saw changed our vision of the world. So let us set sail with the first of our questions. What's the age of discovery? Cantino Planisphere, here, 15.2, depicts the already known world as it became, became known to the Europeans after the first great, great exploration voyages at the end of the 15th century. It also includes here on the screen, the demarcation line of the Treaty of Tordesillas. This treaty establishes in 1494 a distribution in the oceanic race to the Indies, who, with two different and opposite routes, for Portugal by the east and for Castilla by the west. The great explorations respond to crossed interests economic of merchants and navigators, and politic of monarchies and rulers. After the fall of Constantinople, the Silk Road becomes really complicated for trade. And in Atlantic Europe, Portugal and Castile rush to reach the long-awaited spicy islands by sea. It is, known now, it is not known if there's a passage through the West and there are several Castilian expeditions that will go in search of a pass, including that of Magellan, with, where Elcano also goes on board. So, and why go looking for spices on the other side of the world? At that time, spices are a treasure in the hands of 
whoever markets them. Its value is exceptional. A pound of cloves is equivalent to seven grams of the purest gold. The 524 quintals of spices that the now Victoria brings back to Sevilla in its cellar are more than enough to pay the price of the entire Magallanes expedition. It also brings pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, sandalwood, and so on. And this is the reason why Emperor Charles V rewards Elcano with a coat of arms adorned with spices. Specifically, you have here cloves, sorry for the image, but cloves, uh, nutmeg here, and cinnamon, okay, there. And the motto, the motto, we've got it here with the world, with the earth. The motto in recognition of his deed is primus circunde distime, you the first to surround me. And so next question, who was or were the first? It has been said, not Magellan, but what we do owe to Magellan as the organization organizer of the Maluku expedition is the incorporation of the pass of the strait that bears its name today, the Strait of Magellan to world and history and geography, sorry. Because between that region of Chile and the rest of the world, a story began that has already been written for 500 years. As you already know, so a Basque navigator born in Getaria, Juan Sebastián Elcano, portrayed here in front of the village, uh, captains the ship Victoria in 1522 back home. With him, seven European and three indigenous crewmen arrive. Twelve other sailors caught in Cape Verde, in Africa, will do so months later, finally released by Portuguese authorities. And why this is, 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 is it's relevant. What was the Basque country like uh, 500 years ago? The whole of the Basque country, so as said in the north of Castilla, uh, coast and interior uh, is impregnated with a maritime character since multiple trade routes from the interior cross it from north to south. Iron, linen, whale oil, wood for shipbuilding, coal for blacksmiths, cider for expeditions, link agricultural land and Basque ports. And as I said in the beginning of this lecture, the doors of the Atlantic Ocean open on that coast. So in this context, sailing is natural for its inhabitants and from an early age in history, the sea puts them in relation with uh, to Northern Europe and Mediterranean. The Basque Country also has its own laws as well as very well organized and politically related business network based on the relationships of trust, family, neighborhood and culture. All that make the Basque country of the 16th century a maritime power in Europe. And how was the voyage organized and who participated? From 1492 onwards, remember I said that this is the year that Christopher Columbus first arrives in what we will call America. Sevilla here in the south of Spain in Andalusia was a port with, where the presence of the Basque fleet came widespread and strong. In the Casa de Contratación, created in 1503, Basque power groups are important, even in their governmental structure. Powerful European families of merchants and bankers participate in the financing, attracted by the potential gains of the expedition. The Crown of Castilla orders to buy ships and supplies, among them weapons and many iron objects in Basque Country, and to hire almost 240 men to govern the ships. And a good question now, were the women 
also on board. No, no woman ships. In the society of the 16th century, women suffer from many reluctance and prohibitions. However, in the maritime zones and in the absence of men, women carry out truly diverse tasks and there are highly respected women, ship owners and merchants. In the Basque ports, women are fish nets, fishmongers, they retail, they are drivers and they distribute fish. They are loaders, barges that transport iron or wood and paddlers, like in the image, who rowed from shore to shore on the bay of Pasaya, Pasajes. How can, that's a good question remaining here for historians, how can such a relevant role in Basque and international maritime history be forgotten, the one of the women? What would you know about ships at that time? In the 13th century, the Basque fleet was very active on the routes between the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Trade is a solution for an otherwise poor territory. This allows the development of the most modern Navat technology of the time. Basque sailors are highly appreciated and their ships, the most effective of the time, account for 80% of all those who left Sevilla for America during the 16th and 17th centuries. Three of the ships in Magallanes fleet were built in the Basque country. The Trinidad captain ship, the San Antonio mother ship, and the Victoria, the only one I said that will return home after going around the world. They are all medium in size, between 85 and 120 bars, quite small. What do we know about Elcano and his family? He was born in 1487, and the first documents who quote, that quote, sorry, him, are accounting records of the Casa de Contratación de Sevilla in 1519 at the time of boarding with Magellan, he's 32 years old. There we can see who is his parents are, Domingo Sebastián Elcano and Catalina del Puerto. The family enjoys in Getaria a good economical position as evidenced by the register of the town for <clears throat> from the year uh, 5,000, uh, sorry, um, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> 1500, <laughs> sorry, 1,500. Four of the male children are seafarers and a brother-in-law of Elcano as well. We know little of his first years of life. He owns a 200-ton ship, seems to trade between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, and has been serving the king for some time in Levant and Africa. We don't know what his appearance was like, Art has idealized him as a captain with a bird and dressed in elegant clothes, like any hero of the time, like Magellan, with a romantic and mythical look. look sorry. But what we do know is that how he was like inside, and we are sure that we, he was a good captain because he managed to bring his ship, cargo, and crew home. In fact, when he arrives in port with his 17 companions and writes to the king to read him the news of his return, he also asks him to do what is necessary to free 12 other sailors who have been taken prisoner in Cap Verde, as said. A good leader never abandons his team. Whether they are compatriots or no, the crew is your crew. And what do we know about the rest of the crew? We have said that Magellan needed almost 240 people to govern the five ships. So Castilians, most Portuguese, Greek, French, Italian, Belgian, Flemish, English, Irish, and German seafarers will gather in the expedition, there were a really real Tower of Babel on board. Juan Sebastián Elcano is not the only Basque. 33 other Basques set sail with him. There is no doubt that on board the Spice fleet, 
The Basque language is also spoken, discussed, prayed, and sung. We love a lot, Ma. <laughs> we love singing. There is even testimony that the young king of Tidore in the Maluku Islands learned the Biscayan language. It's important to know how to speak the language of the foreigner with whom you want to trade. And how is on board work on board organized? Captain, master, and pilot uh, exercise the highest authority on board. The position of captain is often honorary and noble. If it is the master who manages the boat and due to his knowledge can replace the pilot, who oversees guiding the ship. Uh, Elcano went with Magellan as a master on, the, on board. The boat swain directs the seamen in the maneuvers with the orders received. Sailors are seafarers experienced in handling the rudder and rigging. The cabin boys are young apprentices, 17 to 20 years old. And the pages are even younger, eight years to 15 years old. It's terrific. They do not stop day and night at the other orders, sorry, orders of cabin boys and sailors. Carpenters and caulkers are specialized technicians and therefore essential for the ship. That's why they charge 50% more than sailors. The barbers take care of the health of the crew, how can? And the pantry is responsible for food and drinks. And lastly, there are people in charge of security, such as the sheriff or the gunner. In total, they can add 50 people per boat. How did they live on the ship? And what did they eat? 50 people per boat have 150 meet, square meters of surface where they work, eat, and sleep. Captain, master, and pilot may have their own camera, but the other rest when and how they can, on a mat lying on the ground between guard and guard. On board, water is scarce, so poor hygiene is general. To drink, you take wine and eat biscuits, hard, wet cakes, accompanied with meat, by meat or fish, beans, chickpeas, rice or cheese, while there is something left in the pantry. The dispenser must ensure that there is no fire on board, a danger as great as a waterway. Officers eat apart and something better, of course. In addition to sores, wounds, tumors and fractures, scurvy is the greatest threat. It appears due to a lack of vitamin C, something very frequent in long sea voyages. Leisure is limited, music, reading, gambling without bets. The, omni the religious practice is omnipresent and the homosexual relationships, relations prohibited and punished. How did they navigate without GPS or machines? Sailing is depend on, dependent on winds and currents, not knowing if a violent storm is worse or calm for weeks. For maneuvers, the battel here, carried on board or moored aft, is an essential piece to move. Without it, everything is very complicated. Until the 15th century, it was sailed by land. It was cabotage. With the hourglass or vial and the Disley needle or compass, the position can be estimated, but at sea, Technical needs bring a revolution in the art of sailing. The pilot contrasts the information from astronomical tables or almanacs with that obtained by the quadrant, the cross staff, or the astrolabe, height of the sun or polar star. Really rudimentary tools. <laughs> this also knowing uh, this allows, sorry, knowing the latitude or north-south position and the longitude, that's it to say the east-west position, which is a capital datum to locate the Maluku Islands in the Hispanic or Portuguese part of the Tordesillas Treaty, but it will not be possible to measure it on board until the middle of the 18th century with the 
marine chronometer. So, how many stages did the trip have? The expedition of Magellan and later around the world of Elcano lasted from, as said, from August 1519 to September uh, 1522. The milestone, milestones are 1519, the departure here from uh, Sevilla and from San Lucar de Barrameda, the arrival to Brazil by November, uh, the um, 15, 15, sorry, 20 long stay in Argentina, and the passing, the passage of the Strait of Magellan in the autumn, for us, sorry, the autumn of uh, 1520. Uh, in 1521, crossing the Pacific in four months, that's the same as saying 100 days, an arrival in the Philippines in March, the death of Magellan in combat in April, the appointment of Elcano as captain of the victory in September, arrival at destination in Moluca in November, and in 1522, the eight month non-stop voyage of the um, Victoria ship across the Indian and Atlantic, just with a single stop, as said, in Cap Verde in July, and the arrival, finally, of the survivors to San Lucar de Barrameda and Sevilla on September uh, 1522. And what extraordinary things did they met on their route? In the Atlantic, they come across sharks and flying fish. In Brazil, they taste pineapples and sea parrots, peccaries or wild boars, pink spoonbills. Upon arrival in Patagonia, foxes, ostriches, penguins, sea lions, guanacos. And dressed in their skins, as said, they seen Patagonians taller than they are. They capture some who will later die. They eat mussels and sardines in the Strait of Magellan. They saw indigenous people capable of sailing with a lit fire in their canoes. They are amazed about that. And on several Pacific islands, they eat coconuts, oranges, and palm wine, rice and chicken in the Philippines, and the natives sail in reds and prows, as seen here in the Pigafetas Chronicle. In Borneo, they go to the palace on the back of elephants and drink rice wine and cloth and cinnamon tea in a porcelain cup. They show crocodiles and eat turtle. Cloves, nutmeg and ginger are loaded in the maluku, as said, and the king gives them several stuffed birds of paradise. And two last questions. What changed after the trip? So, as said, those historical events had extraordinary consequences in a multitude of areas, not only in the uh, field of navigation and uh, cosmography or naval engineering, but also in the fields of economy, food, geography, thought, thought and mentalities. From now on, as said, nothing would be like before. The modern area begins and basic products such as corn or potatoes arrive in Europe. Henceforth, man was not subject to the foodstuffs which had always been produced in his territory, but new products from afar could complete, uh, complement his diet and, by the way, enrich his gastronomy. There is a more precise drawing of the sphericity of the earth and its human and geographic diversity. Scientific advances allow us to go farther and farther in less time. Science and knowledge take a step towards freedom of thought. The whole globe is brought together for the first time and a growing worldwide intercommunication begin. People, ideas and goods move more easily. But the first globalization also marks the beginning of a greater human impact on the environment and on cultural and natural diversity, in many cases, negative. And last question, why remember the first round the world today? 
Uh, this is Elcano's, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, way of doing uh, and thinking. So with the first round, the world in 1522, a new era begins, crucial for humanity and its relationships on a planetary scale. As said, it is the first globalization. Its consequences span 500 years and beyond celebrating or judging the past, remembering and understanding the first round the world tour is a great opportunity to reflect individually and collectively our, on our challenges as a society today. Our current challenges run in relationship, in relation, sorry, to the environment, cultural diversity, migration, economy, power relations, poverty, or even injustice at the global and local levels at the same time. Many of these challenges are set in the sea, the oceans, that same sea and those oceans that have united us since Magellan and his crew crossed the Atlantic and the Pacific, and then Elcano went around the world for the first time. Knowing the past better help us understand the present and prepare our future. So, this is the end. I want to encourage you all, therefore, to continue exploring the world and learn from other realities and historical facts and reconsider social models and ways of life today. That is why the Elcano Foundation's claim is Basques around the world again. Thanks a lot. In Hungarian, I think, Nagyon uh, Kösönöm for you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafa. It was really interesting to hear about uh, uh, so much about those kind of expeditions we we couldn't imagine. Uh, the expeditions nowadays are totally different uh, what uh, mm. those people survived that time. We have a couple of questions and I, I, I do have a question first for you. Uh, that uh, I know that you are passionate of the oceans uh, and, and the sea. Uh, have you ever sailed through the Magellanes Strait? <laughs> no. <laughs> I should have done, but you <laughs> I should have, we should have been in Chile and in, in Strait of Magellan and, and the whole uh, region, Magellanic region, in, uh, in March, last March. And unfortunately, COVID-19, uh, Iberia and so on stopped the flights. At, but uh, in French, we say partie remise. Uh, it should be kind of, uh, we shall do it a little bit uh, later. So... Yeah. Uh, Let's yeah. go in another time. We'll try, we'll try. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, one question uh, arrived to uh, the Chilean ambassador, Veronica Chakin uh, from Monu. He, she asks that, uh, uh, can you say more, more about the indigenous people of uh, Patagonia? It's a hard question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, yes, I can say a lot because it was quite unique culture because of the weather and geographic position they had. So if she wants to have a more detail, we have a museum that uh, she can visit in the, in the web. It's the museum, hold on, I have the name here, but it's in uh, Punta Arenas. We have uh, the whole museum of the city of Punta Arena devoted to the way of living of, the, of those indigenous people. Uh, the name is, uh, hold on. Actually, I don't have it here in my note, but it's just for her to look uh, for the museum in, uh, in, uh, in Magayan uh, region. That's one alternative. And the other one, but a little bit more general, if she's interested in the origin people of, um, of the whole country, we have nine different etnias. There is a pre-Columbian uh, museum also that is located in Santiago. Uh, our country, because of COVID, has released uh, information and uh, visit online of uh, all the museum of Chile. So 
I think uh, it's the opportunity to go and visit uh, those places through internet. And Rafa, I really hope you can make it to Chile. Because <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> as in your presentation, we could understand what it was to travel on that day to yeah. so far away from Europe land as my country. <laughs> I mean, to go there will allow you to perceive in a better way how people could live on those conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I also have a suggestion that uh, in the third game, uh, I don't know which, um, in 19 uh, September issue, we have written about the Selk nuns uh, a lot. Mm. It, uh, it, it, it was a Patagonian indigenous uh, people who already uh, disappeared, unfortunately, but uh, it's, it's a really interesting story. Uh, if somebody else do have uh, more questions, then please let us know. And in the meantime, I also have a question uh, to the ambassador of Spain that I'm really curious that uh, uh, how do you celebrate in Spain this uh, uh, nice anniversary? Because uh, in your country is much more important than, than here in Hungary. Uh, we are celebrating it because it's, it's the Explorers Day and uh, I, I, I think it's our mission, but uh, uh, in your history, uh, this expedition uh, plays a much more important, important role. Well, thank you very much. Interesting question. And I was, I was looking at the pictures of uh, Rafael, and for me, it is a, a personal um, interest because I, well, my father was a diplomat too, and he was posted to Chile, and my mother was pregnant, and uh, well, I, I was born in, in Madrid, but my first trip was by boat sailing from mm -hmm. Santander to Valparaíso. I was wondering now, uh, <laughs> because I, I know we stopped in Rio de Janeiro, but I don't know whether my, my parents died, whether I went through the Canal of Panama or, or circumnavigating the Strait of Magallanes. Uh, so, I mean, personally, it is something very interesting for me. And as for Spain, uh, well, apart from this globalization of the world, it was the first steps towards creating a very important cultural community, which is the Ibero-American community. Um, I, I, I state many times that this privilege of sharing the same language is something very unique. Um, I have been, I was responsible for, for multilateral uh, Latin American affairs, and it was wonderful to be sitting 22 countries around the table speaking Spanish. I mean, there was also Portugal and Brazil, but they understand Spanish very well. So this, uh, and, and we have, um, we have deep uh, cultural uh, common roots. And well, in Spain, there, there, there has been a, a commission uh, created for this uh, circumnavigation. And yeah, it is, it is that very important first step towards the globalization of the world. Yes, thank you. Uh, does anybody still have question that we have uh, two more minutes? Then we, after we have to thank to our distinguished guests to be presented here. Uh, I see. Yes. No more question. Uh, our time is over. So I would like to thank uh, to Veronica Chakin, ambas ambassador of Chile, and to Anunciada Fernandez de Cordova, ambassador of Spain, and also to uh, Rafa, uh, to ha holding this really interesting presentation for us. And thank you very much uh, to be here, and uh, hope you see you next time on the Explorers Day, or in Chile, or in Spain. On <laughs> Or Rafa, you, you, you are really welcome in, in Budapest. You will like it if you, <laughs> if you come here. Thank you very much again to be here.